Sandusco historian uh, and project manager, actually founder of the B-25 History Project. Uh, this presentation is on the uh, North American Aviation Plant, Kansas plant uh, history. Uh, a lot of people know about the Inglewood plant, um, the uh, lesser known um, for some reason, because we built more planes. Just going to rub that in because you guys are from California. Um, so there's a doctor in front of my name. I'm a historian, but the doctor has absolutely nothing to do with uh, history. I don't have a degree in history, didn't go to school for history. Um, so what is a historian and why do I call myself one? So in my opinion, a historian has to study history, uh, has to preserve history. Typically historians will specialize in one field or another. In my case, it's the B-25 specifically, the Fairfax B-25s and that plant. They must teach what they learn uh, and they must do so without distorting the facts. That's probably the most important and the hardest to do as a historian. Uh, and finally, Wikipedia and Arcadia books are not valid resources. I give this to high schools all the time. I just want to give that shout out to all the English teachers. <clears throat> so my focus is to learn more and more about less and less. So the more I learn, kind of the more I focus on what I'm doing. Uh, again, I only study the B-25. I cannot identify 99.2% of the airplanes that flew during World War II. That's not my thing. B-25, I can pick them out every time. Um, but specifically, I, my focus is the Fairfax plant. Although a lot of people consider me a B-25 historian, I consider myself a Fairfax plant historian because that's where my love is. So we're going to start talking about Fairfax Airport. There would not have been a plant there if there wouldn't have been an airport there. Um, it's located on the Goose Island River Bend of the Missouri River for all of those history buffs out there. In 1921 was its first known use as an airfield. Um, and by 1925, it was actually operated as an airfield. It was called the Sweeney Airport, and Jay Sweeney was the operator of that airport. 1928, it was purchased by the Wood Brothers, and on um, August 4th of 1929, it was dedicated to the Fairfax Municipal Airport. Um, this is a picture of the Fairfax Municipal Airport taken from the air in 1929. Not much there, just a bunch of grass. Um, Fairfax Field, it was Naval Reserve Station. It was established in 1935, so jump forward a few more years and the Navy kind of moved in. And July 12, 1937, Navy and Marine Squadrons moved um, onto the airport. And in September 1st, 1940, so we're still before the war, uh, they started a Marine Air Flight Program. But by June 16, 1942, for reasons we'll talk about later, the Naval Air uh, Aviation Training moved from Fairfax out here to where we are right now is the Olathe Naval Air Station. Um, so there's that connection between B-25s and where we're sitting today. Um, so on December 7, 1940, exactly one year prior to um, the United States entering World War, officially, I guess, entering uh, World War II, um, Pearl Harbor Day, um, they announced that a plant would be built. It'd be owned by the federal government and operated by North American Aviation. Uh, Kansas City uh, would purchase the airport and lease it to the Army Air Corps. It cost them a dollar a year. Uh, this is an early picture of building uh, B-25Ds. You can tell it's early because they're all guys. Um, it would be a blackout building. No windows. Doors were covered, both air-conditioned and heated. Uh, just over a million square feet that would be doubled by the end of the war. Uh, it had a one a uh, foot thick curtain wall around the plant. It was not camouflaged, um, but it was designed to be difficult to see above 500 feet. Now this is a later, this is after the addition, so this is the full plant. But the one thing I'll kind of point out here is if you look at the roof of the building, it's very plain, and it also looks exactly like the asphalt down here. You get above 500 feet, it looks like a parking lot. It wasn't camouflaged, it didn't need to be. Obviously you're gonna be bombing it at, at well above 500 feet, so it would be very difficult to bomb this plant because you wouldn't know exactly where it was. Um, the architects, uh, Allen and Kelly, Builders Building of Indiana, uh, some of the general contractors, there were plenty of them um, throughout. All of the structural steel uh, came from Muskogee Iron Works in Oklahoma. Most of the employees, most of the labor was provided by the uh, Army Corps of Engineers. Um, so this is the groundbreaking um, ceremony that happened. Well, we've got a little problem here. We can't really see. That's ah, better. March 8, 1941. Uh, this is the picture that hit the papers. Um, uh, from your left to right, this is uh, Governor Payne Ratner, Major Nielsen, and um, Mr. Kindleberger right there. He was a guy that was running North American at the time. Uh, most importantly, he's the cute little kid that makes selling newspapers so much easier. Um, there's actually a handful of pictures that were taken about this day, uh, about this time, uh, and it was a huge event. 
right in front of it that day was also named Kindleberger Road. Um, I like to point out the fact that Kindleberger Road still is called Kindleberger Road, but they misspell it now. After the flood uh, in 51, when they put up all the road signs, they misspelled the name and they've yet to change it. Um, so let's talk a little bit about construction. Of course, we uh, first shovels hit the ground on, on uh, March 8th when, uh, when we had the ground breaking. Literally just three days later, we started construction. This is a picture that was taken um, on that day. Um, basically, I told you it was on the Goose Island River Bend. It's basically a big floodplain. It's all sand. So the way they had to, to build it is they just flattened the land. They dug a bunch of holes into the ground, poured concrete piers way down, concrete concrete slab on top and then built the uh, buildings on top of it. So by April 7th, 1941, the first structural steel was erected. Um, and by July of 1941, the structural steel was completed. So we're now been building from March to July. and We've got all the steel put up uh, and obviously all the concrete underneath it. This particular picture was taken um, in the, the uh, first week of September. It appeared in a September 7th um, newspaper article. Um, and at the time, they were reporting, <coughs> shortly uh, after that, they reported the plant as 90% complete. Doesn't really look 90% complete, but <coughs> I'll go with it. So let's talk a little bit about the employees from the plant. Now, the first thing you'll notice, this might look familiar to you, you, you people here, is uh, that's the Inglewood plant. And the reason is because the first 53 men came from the Ingle, Inglewood plant. I say men quite specifically. Uh, of course, the... Basically, the three head bosses, the factory manager, the division engineer, and the production manager all came from the, from the plant, along with eight educators that formed the, uh, the group of people that taught us how to build airplanes, along with 28 supervisors and 14 employees. Um, I have the, uh, the, the names of all 50 of those people. Uh, I just don't put them up here on the slides because it's kind of too much information for this presentation. Uh, all of them uh, were transferred to Kansas City by mid-July. Um, that date is kind of important. Because on July 8, 1941, the first employee was hired here in Kansas. That's a picture of him right there. Um, it's James F. Bryant. It's not the greatest picture of him if you want to know what he looks like. But it's my favorite picture of him because it shows him doing what he does best. He was a jig welder, and he's uh, actually welding on old number one. That was actually the first, that was the start of Kansas building airplanes, was building that first center section jig. We'll talk about that here in a second. January 42, I'm going to jump ahead just a little bit. The first women were actually hired for production. Now, this is not included administrative work, secretarial, and that kind of thing. They started working in the raw stock storeroom, which is what you see this picture of here. Uh, and here's the, the names of those nine ladies. A year later, eight of those nine ladies still worked at the plant, and three of them had been promoted to supervisory pr uh, positions. Um, so let's jump back to where we were. Um, the plant was originally designed as an assembly center for B-25Cs. They were designed to build 100 B-25Cs per month. Uh, and this information uh, was put out by, the, uh, by North American as late as October of 1941. We were not going to manufacture here. We're basically just going to assemble. And we're basically making the same thing that we're making over at the Inglewood plant. They're going to be just another plant to build Cs. The first parts were arriving in uh, June of 41. Um, the way they did that is the first 100 were sent directly from the Inglewood plant, um, and the first six were in major sub-assembly uh, form. There were three that came first and three right after that. Um, basically, bolt them together, fly them out of there. Um, as the numbers went from six through 100, the planes were in smaller and smaller pieces, but they were all ready to be put together. One of the biggest problems they had is when they transported them from Inglewood, all the parts would shift and tweak and turn, and they had to put all of that back together. Um, they had yet to build most of the jigs that they needed to make that work happen. Assembly started. Um, I've got likely late November of 1941 there. I've got conflicting information, which is why I say that. Um, in all honesty, it was sometime in November. It may have been as early as November 1st. Um, so. By December, we're now calling them B-25Ds. It's important to remember there's absolutely no way to distinguish a D from a C unless you see the serial number on the plane. They're absolutely identical. Um, there are some modifications that were made to the Ds later uh, in, in time that they didn't ever do uh, to the Cs. Um, but if you see a D, you can't tell it from a C, 
unless you see the serial number because they're absolutely identical. Um, we built 2,290 D models uh, from December of 1941 through March of 1944, um, which takes us to December of 1941. So this is the day after Pearl Harbor was attacked. Um, I've seen this picture in a couple different books now and a couple different presentations. And a lot of people like to go, oh, hey, look, um, you know, Pearl Harbor's attacked and all these people are wanting to go to work at this defense plant and defend their country. It's a great story, but it's probably not true. Judging by the shadows, this picture was taken in the morning. Um, and of course, the, the speech by FDR was kind of the big press and news media. It's very likely that a lot of these people weren't even aware that Pearl Harbor was attacked. Now, some of them probably were, but not every, every one of them uh, was. The reality is this line occurred every day. You have to remember, we're still in the Depression. Um, the average person, the average worker made 50 cents an hour at about this time. And if you went through the uh, defense training program and, and got a skilled job at the plant, you could make in excess of $1.40 an hour. So you're looking at three times what the average person was making. People wanted these jobs. There was an on-site health care. There was a doctor that was there all the time. They had daycare. You wanted this job. Um, so this was kind of an average day at the plant. But it does make a good story. So December 23rd, 1941, literally just a couple of weeks after Pearl Harbor, we christened our first ship. Um, the B-25D, we call her Miss Greater Kansas City. That's what we tattooed on the side of her. Um, and so just 16 days after Pearl Harbor, Mrs. Thomas Benders, the one there uh, exploding the champagne bottle on her, um, she was the wife of the first final assembly line employee. So Thomas Bender was the first person that was, that was uh, hired for the assembly line portion. I remember that the gentleman we talked about before, um, was, uh, he was hired to, to uh, build the jigs. This is a picture of her on her first uh, her day of her first flight, which was January 3rd, 1942. Um, it, it's funny, this picture actually was printed, you can tell because the serial number's been redacted. They took a little marker and scratched it out so you couldn't tell what the first number was in anything that was public. Um, first pilot was actually Paul Balfour. He's not the one that was originally uh, supposed to fly her, but he's the one that ended up flying her. Jim Bradley was, was the co-pilot. Jim Bradley is an engineer. He's not a pilot at all. At those times, you were not required to be a pilot to sit in the co-pilot seat. Um, it was accepted by the United States Army Air Force in February of 1942. It spent some time up at Wright-Patterson, then was used as a trainer until it was scrapped in, in uh, July of 1945. Um, everybody, you see, all, it's kind of hard to see in this picture, but all the, you see all the people lined up there. That is the entire plant, uh, all the employees came out, and it was uh, January 3rd in Kansas City. There was ice everywhere. so. Unlucky number 13, the only loss of life accident in a, during a test flight, um, just so happened to coincidentally be the 13th aircraft that we built. Um, in April uh, 26th of 1942, um, basically she lost an engine uh, when she was taking off, never got um, probably about 50 feet uh, off the air, never even um, off the ground, never even pulled her gear up. Uh, Attempted to loop back around to land again um, and ended up in that unfortunate wreckage there and um, all on board, um, including the chief test pilot uh, at the time, uh, Ray Quick. Um, so unfortunately, but there were several other accidents um, throughout uh, the, the history of the plant, but that's the only one that was actually loss of life. I think everybody's probably seen this picture. Um, it's a great picture. It's kind of typical of um, the assembly line in 1942. This is October of 1942 is when this picture was taken. Um, again, I want to focus on the fact that it's seen as an assembly. We weren't really making anything here other than the center section. The only th reason we were making the center section is because it was too big to transport. Everything else was made elsewhere and brought to us. Um, when we got all these parts, many parts didn't meet spec. Um, we had to throw a lot of them out. We had to rework a lot of them. There was a lot of work that needed to be done. So basically, the suppliers could not meet the demands that the factory was putting on them. Um, so a lot of people like to say that the plant was not able to, you know, that they had some issues with starting up and stuff like that. It wasn't an issue here. It was an issue with the suppliers of the plant. And it would be resolved uh, in the coming months. 
It was resolved by this issue right here. Obviously, that's not the Kansas plant. That's the B-29. We never built them here. But on February 7th, 1942, we were given a contract to build 200 B-29 bombers. And almost immediately, that was increased to 300. The reason was because the Army felt the B-29 bomber was going was to win the war. This big, high altitude, well, this is how we're going to win the war. Um, so they started a new project. It was going to be what we now call the High Bay Expansion. It's going to double the size of the plant. Um, and the plan was to build uh, the B-29 in the new plant, build the B-25 right where we're building it now. So we're going to build those two side by side. That was in February 7th of 1942. So a little bit about the High Bay ex expansion. Um, you see the full plant there. The High Bay in specifically is right here. Uh, the expansion included this building, it included this building, and some of this over here. Uh, all of that was added to this section right here, which was the original plant. Um, and so that pretty much doubled the square footage of the plant and gave us the ability to do that. Now, interesting uh, enough here, I will note here that the B-29 contract was canceled in June of nine, uh, 1942. So what happened between February and June of 1942? April of 1942, we had a small little group of B-25s flew off a little aircraft carrier. Um, it was at that point that the government realized that the B-25 may be a little bit better than we thought it was going to be. So they canceled the contract uh, to build the B-29s, allowed the expansion to occur, and doubled the contract for B-25s at the Kansas plant. Uh, construction started on the high bay in July of 42 and would be complete by March of 43. So at that point, we would turn from an assembly center to a manufacturing center. Um, by the time we, we were uh, done with that expansion, 60% of the plane was manufactured in-house. Uh, we built a foundry, we started pouring our own castings and those kind of things. Um, so that's also when, this is kind of what, when people think of the Kansas plant, this is kind of the image that they get with the big overhead conveyor system and an in-ground rail system. You notice that this airplane right here um, is actually um, on the last line of the uh, final assembly line. And you'll see the rails down below. And you'll note that the wheels aren't touching the ground. Um, and that's because they didn't touch the ground until they left the, they were all on rails all the way through. This is kind of what the plant looked like after that expansion. All of the manufacturing was here, the sub-assemblies were here, and the final assembly was here. The rail system would bring things from the sub-assemblies into where they were needed uh, and when they were needed uh, to uh, final assemble the airplanes. Uh, that was a zigzag pattern, basically working this direction and then out uh, through what used to be the paint booth, but by late D production, they had stopped painting uh, B-25s, uh, and none of the J's went out of the factory. This building uh, painted. So I like this picture of the overhead crane system. It's kind of what makes our plant famous, if it will, because all the pictures you see um, are of this. Um, I call this the irons down below, and basically when the fuselage is being put together, it's hanging. Once it gets big enough to put wheels underneath it, that's when they put it on the platform and, carry, and wheel it through the rest of it. Um, but this is uh, coming from a subassembly, so the wing subassembly is back over here, and they're brought up across here and then dropped down onto the plane down off screen here. You can see some empennage coming along the same pattern here. They actually came around the wing section and then spun around and were dropped on the plane. We'll see a picture of that uh, here in a little bit. I'd like to point out Virginia Robinson is a young lady that I met who's unfortunately no longer with us. She was one of the, the crane operators that actually managed uh, this crane system. This is the empennage coming back. And you can, it's kind of hard to see here, but you can kind of see where it drops down to this position. They have somebody in here that actually the, this whole uh, uh, pulley system that they've got here will actually drop it the rest of the way down. So production was increasing as obviously we had more room. We got better at doing what we were doing. Uh, cost steadily decreased. It cost a lot less to build an airplane later in the war than it did at the beginning of the war. Uh, led us to our production record, 315 planes built uh, in January of 1945 in one month. So that's just a, a bit over a, a plane, uh, 10 planes a day, um, which is pretty impressive considering the technology that they had uh, to work with at the time. Because of that, uh, actually not the, the best day there, but because of how well that they were doing, 
the Army uh, gave them the E Award, um, and this is a picture of the ceremony right there. That's their flag. It was presented on October 6th, 6th of 1944. Um, interestingly enough, on that same day, the 30,000th North American airplane, now this is not the 30,000th one from the Kansas plant or even a B-25, this is the 30,000th plane that North American as a company had built for the Kansas plant. Just to give you an idea, you'll notice there's not a lot of paint on this airplane. It's one of the J's. Um, it was presented on October 6th of 1944. It took us a little while to get it over to where it was going to go. Uh, by January 13th of 1945 is when it made it to uh, its unit overseas. And on January 29th, 1945, just a couple weeks later, it was crashed and lost. Uh, basically, what had happened is they were coming back from a mission. There were two airplanes. Uh, well, there were all of the airplanes were landing. The plane in front uh, slid off the runway, and they were already on approach. They pretty much just full throttled, pulled up, so that they didn't hit that aircraft. Um, and as the pilots will tell you, that's not good on engines. They lost an engine and put it into the uh, put it into the ocean just off the island. Production in 1945, I like this picture. Um, this is the janitorial um, staff. That's the V for victory. Um, they had a production surplus. Um, by the late 1944, early 1945, we were building them faster than we needed them. A lot of them were getting flown straight to storage where they would uh, sit for a while in, in some cases. Because of this, um, they knew they weren't going to get a renewal on the contract for the B-25. So they signed a contract on March 2nd of 1945 for, to build P-80s. Now this was a super top secret uh, aircraft back in the day. It was a jet. Um, they didn't talk much about this contract for a couple of reasons. First of all, because they couldn't, because they didn't want anybody knowing how many they were going to build and when they were going to be ready and that kind of thing. Um, but also it didn't really last all that long because, of course, what happens just a couple months later, victory in Europe. So VE Day, May 8th, 1945, Germany surrendered. Uh, we no longer need P-80s, do we? So on May 25th, just a couple weeks later, they canceled the contract for the P-80 and was one of the biggest layoffs um, in plant history. About 20% of the employees, about 1,500 at the time, were made available to other industries by termination. That's the terminology that they got in the mail with their letter. Um, I guess that's the polite way of saying you're fired. Um, but many of the, the employees that lost their jobs here went to work at other plants, um, some of them even down in Fairfax, so it didn't really make much of a difference to a lot of people. Uh, we've got VJ Day. I'm going to point out the fact that there's two VJ Days. The surrender was actually announced on August 15th, 1945. That is an important date because on August 15th, 1945, everybody showed up for work on the day shift after the, the, the surrender was announced, and they were told to go home. Don't call us, we'll call you, basically. And so they did. Now, the, the formal surrender wouldn't happen until September 2nd of 45, which if you ask somebody what VJ Day is, that's likely the, the date that they're going to give you. But the August 15th date is important because of this. On August 20th, 1945, so Friday of that week, everybody got a little letter saying, come back and get your personal stuff. You're all laid off. So they canceled the contract to build the B-25s. Now, basically what happened here is there was a general, and I've yet to be able to identify the general, and this is all from personal stories. It's been told by several people that were there. He walked into the plant, and he pointed at an aircraft, and he said, we'll take everything from here forward. I tell you this story because it explains something about the numbers. Now, you'll notice when I tell you the numbers on an air, on a B-25s, I tell you 6,680. The numbers that you see in a lot of books is 6,608. The difference is 72 aircraft. As it turns out, you point at one aircraft, and I know which aircraft he pointed at, and you count forward, you'll get 72 aircraft. Those 72 aircraft are mentioned uh, actually as far back as Norm Avery back in the 90s when he wrote his book that said that there were 72 aircraft that were incomplete but flyable that were accepted. They were complete. What makes them incomplete is the fact that they didn't have guns on them. The guns were never owned by North American. They were always property of the government. So the day the plant closed, the government took all their guns. So you could no longer arm the planes. You'll notice this is the very last plane um, that was built at, at the plant. October 15, 1945 is when she was completed, and indeed this picture was taken. The first thing you'll notice when you see her is there's no guns anywhere to be seen. She's a complete aircraft. She flew out of there, but she had no guns. Those 72 aircrafts were built, but they just 
they just didn't have their weapons. Um, the last group of them were flown to storage uh, on October 31st of 1945. Um, so this is in August. Um, they closed the plant in August. Basically, there's about 2,000 people left to kind of finish building the plants and get everything scrapped and you know taken care of. October 31st, the last plane walks out the door. And by November 5th, actually, General Motors had taken over the plant. So they wasted no time moving in. Um, so basically, just kind of some summaries. It was an operation from no November 41 to October 45, it was 47 months. Our first employee was hired here July 8th. There was 59,337 employees. We built 6,680 B-25s, 2,290 Ds, 4,390 Js. We produced more medium bombers than any other plant in the world during World War II right here. If you do the math, it comes out to about two-thirds of the total of the B-25s that were built. So let's talk a little bit about today. One of my favorite pictures of B-25s, just because it's really cool. There's, depending on what you call an airframe, there's approximately 150 known airframes. Of those 150, about 130 of them were built here in Kansas City. Um, there's about 37 actively flying. <clears throat> of those that are actively flying, all but two were built here in Kansas City. Um, there's about seven that are being restored to flying condition. And there's about, <clears throat> excuse me, about 10 others that could uh, fairly easily, easily return to the air. A little Iran, some engine work, something like that. And we get them back up in the air. As you guys well know, it's about $2,000 uh, an hour to fly. Um, and that includes maintenance, yada, 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 on down the road insurance and that kind of stuff. The remainder um, of those are um, in static displays pretty much everywhere. A couple of them are actually underwater. So I want to kind of close out with kind of what happened to the Fairfax plant and, and the airport as well. So here's a picture um, of March 31st, 1985, the day the Fairfax airport closed. Um, that's Fairfax Ghost there. She's now flying as Red Bull. Um, one of our wing members here and a good friend of mine and also uh, helped out a lot with my organization uh, was uh, one of the mechanics on that, uh, on that uh, aircraft back in the day. They, in the afternoon, uh, had a flight over the airport and they dropped a wreath over the airport. It's kind of like a ceremonial ending of the day. They were supposed to land, refuel, and wait till 11.59 when they would be the last plane out. When they um, came in to land, their nose gear did not indicate as locked. Now, obviously, you can't land at that airport because if that nose gear collapses, you're now going to drive it out because you can't fly it out even if you fix it because the airport's closed. So they were forced to circle around. They tried to fix it, couldn't fix it, and they flew to the, their new home, basically. It was another airport. When they landed, it turns out it was a, a faulty switch. It was absolutely nothing wrong with the landing gear. Everything was fine. They could have landed and taken off again, but, of course, you can't take that risk. So the last flight was by a little Cessna 402 piloted, piloted by Holly Hollinger and left the uh, airport at 1159. This is a picture of um, taken actually mid-90s. This is the GM plant. You can still see some remnants of the Fairfax uh, runways still there. Basically, this group of trees right here, that's where the Fair, Fairfax plant used to be, and that's the parking lot. So GM takes over the plant November 5th of 1945. They, it was a Buick Oldsmobile Pontiac plant, and they worked there all the way up until May 8th of 87 when they closed the plant and built the new plant over here. January 1st of 89, during the demo, demolition of the old plant, the plant caught fire and was completely destroyed. Absolutely nothing remained. Um, so jump forward to just a few years ago. As we all know, General Motors was essentially taken over by the government. Uh, as part of that agreement, uh, General Motors was asked to sell off a lot of vacant land that they had all over, not just here. Um, and obviously the plant, uh, where the plant used to be, was there. This picture, uh, whoops, this picture right here is the gates where the, that's the employee gate to the factory. This is where the employees would drive through. This is a picture of the same gates in 2014. Uh, they survive to, uh, to this day. They had been, uh, the fencing on them is different because of the uh, 51 flood, but the posts and everything were all there. So when the government um, required G General Motors to get rid of that land, they sold it off. I went to the company that owned it and was doing work on it, and I said, can I have, please? And they said, yes, where do you want it? 
And so they were nice enough to cut down that gate section. So we have that and we're currently restoring that. And we'll put that back up in the honor uh, of the men and women that drove through those gates every day for those four years. A um, little, bit, little bit more about me and the B25 History Project, uh, not-for-profit corporation. Um, our most visible presence is b25history.org. Um, our mission is to preserve and honor the history of the B-25 bomber, the men and women who built, flew, and maintained. Um, and we do that different ways. One of which is if you go to the Wyandotte County Historical Museum, you'll find two memorials out there. I'll, I'll have pictures of them here in a second. We do education presentations like the one I'm doing right now, museum displays like the one in the back corner that, uh, that we have up here at this particular museum. And we also do what we can to support B-25s. So that means doing events like we did yesterday, um, promoting you guys coming in here and those kind of things. We do everything we can, albeit small, to help with that. This is me, and uh, that's not your aircraft. That's okay. I've been a B-25 historian for 25 plus years. I got involved actually in 1989 with my grandfather and the B-25 Bomber Builders Newsletter. We sent a quarterly newsletter out to over 900 former bomber builders and, and did an annual reunion from 89 to 2004. I designed and we built the Bomber Builders Memorial, which I'll show you in a second. And in here, just last year, I was named Historian of the Year by the Kansas City, uh, Wyandotte County uh, Historical Society. So at the museum, we've got a vertical uh, tail and rudder assembly that was signed by a little over 100 um, men and women that, that worked at the plant. We're obviously on the internet. We do stuff at air shows. Uh, although we haven't written any books, um, we are actually referenced in quite a few books, and we've helped many people write uh, with information. Um, the gentleman on the right there is my grandfather. That is our memorial that we built. Um, we won't go into that whole mess about why that plane looks like it does, but um, <laughs> we tried. Um, so it's at the Wyandotte County Historical Museum. It was re erected by the Bomber Builders Newsletter. We raised the money ourselves. And, um, and had it planted there. Um, it is listed on the National Historical Markers list, and it was dedicated on Saturday, May 2nd, 1998. That was just a few years ago. Again, there's my grandfather. Uh, this is uh, George Bauer, if you know him, uh, or maybe have read his book. Um, and that is the tail assembly that we have. Uh, it's just leaning up against a wall there, but it's now on permanent display. It looks a lot better than that now. You'll see the black marks on it are actually scribbled signatures and departments from, I believe it's 107 um, of former Fairfax employees. The gentleman on the far right is Jim Stella. He's the one who was a Fairfax crew member, um, and he also did the restoration work on, on, the, on that. We dedicated that on um, August 18th of 1996. So b25history.org, that's my website. Um, I've got over 150 uh, pages currently. I've got probably about 3,000 that I want to add to that. Um, we get about 3,600 uh, page hits per month, um, all these sorts of information, more to come. But I want to talk just a little bit about the reason I do what I do. This is one of them right here, my grandfather. I love this picture of my grandfather. Uh, the funny thing is this was taken in uh, fall of 1942. I know that for several reasons. First of all, this is his fall jacket that still exists. It's at my father's house. That was 42. It had many patches that were sewn on <laughs> by my grandmother between now and then. But the coolest part about this one is this is a 1942 selfie. If you look down in his right hand there, it kind of looks funny, and you can just barely see the string where he's activating the shutter on his camera. And it was sitting on a tripod, and he took this picture because he was proud of where he worked, as you can see his North American Aviation shirt. And that little dot right up there in the top, this is three-month pin. So this would have been taken in probably around, I'm going to say, August, September of 1942. He worked in Department 2, sheet metal details. Uh, for the most part, he worked as a punch press operator and a riveter. This is my grandmother. This picture was taken on the same day. She was an inspector at the plant. And uh, she was inspector number 457. Everybody called her Send Them Back Alice because she was extremely picky. And I don't know that because I worked with her. I know that because she's my grandmother. <laughs> she was actually an artist before she joined the war effort. Um, she worked for a local company called Hobby House where she was a master painter. So she was, did all the final detail work. Um, she was a wonderful artist. And, and I actually have a couple works that she did uh, during the day. Um, because of her eye for detail and stuff like that, she made a perfect inspector. And she started working there in 1942 when um, her place of employment had to close because you couldn't get metal to build what she was building. 
Mary White was here last night as well. Uh, she worked in Department 22, uh, Electrical and Radio. And inter this picture was taken in 45. That's her husband of 71 years, D. Uh, and this is a picture of them on their first date. I include this picture because Mary White's a wonderful person. Um, she's quite active on social media. Um, and on top of that, this is just a really cool picture of the two of them. Um, Alice Vaught's another one that I have a, a great photograph of. This, again, was a picture that was taken in about 44. Uh, her family owned a restaurant that was down in the Fairfax district. That is the restaurant behind her. Uh, she worked in Department 32. She was rear section structure. She was the one that climbed, in, climbed into the back of the plane and riveted. Uh, she's maybe about, I don't know, what is that, about four and a half feet tall. Um, she's a wonderful lady and actually just got some news uh, press because she's... Uh, making blankets for babies at one of our local children's hospitals. Even to this day, she's giving to the community. She's a wonderful lady. I love her dearly. Um, so at that, I will explain this picture, and then I'll leave it open for questions. This picture was taken at the pit. Everybody seeing this picture was great. Um, basically, they had what was called the pit at the plant. Um, every gun on the B-25 was tested before it left. That happened 24 hours a day, even at night. So they pulled them up to the pit, which was a big concrete bunker that had a ton of sand in it, and they lit them up. Uh, at nighttime, as you can tell, it makes a wonderful picture. Um, there were two different photo shoots that I know of um, from the pit that were done with different B-25s, probably the same night. Um, and they make just beautiful pictures. But I'm expecting good questions, so go for it. Yes? Did any of assemblies of this of the B-25 find their way to being used by Doolittle? No. Yeah, I, I will. Um, so he's asking whether or not uh, any of the original uh, B-25s from here were, um, were used by Doolittle. Doolittle's planes were all B models. Uh, and they were old B models, uh, all with the exception of one, and that's the plane that Doolittle flew himself, which is a whole other hour-long presentation. But um, they were outdated at the time. They were already building Cs um, when the Doolittle Raid, and we had just started building airplanes here. Um, by the time the Doolittle Raid occurred, we'd probably built about four aircraft. So none of them were used in the raid. Um, I think the biggest reason they used the Bs was a couple. The United States never used the B model. The Doolittle Raid was unique, that the B model was never used by the United States in combat. It was essentially a trainer with the exception of the Doolittle Raid. And the point behind that was they were basically going to give the planes to China at the end of it. Uh, and we shipped many uh, of the uh, B models overseas, but that we used the B models mainly just to train our people on how to fly B-25s. Next. Of those 37 that are currently flying, how many are in the, in the U.S.? Okay, that's a great question. Of the 37 that are currently flying, there are only two of them well, you've got, yeah, Serena and Red Bull are the only two right now that are flying overseas. Um, uh, Serena is in the Netherlands and Red Bull is in Australia. Uh, no, Austria. Austria. I was going to say there's Reavers is down in Australia is putting one together. They say they're going to put it back together and fly, but they've got a long time before they get, probably 20 years before they get, they get that one put back together because um, she needs some love. And then more specifically about our airplane, the yep. PDJ, how did that go? You know, you were saying that they all went out as Army Air Corps mm -hmm. airplanes unpainted. Correct. How did it go from there to being the way it looks there? So the ramp? starting with late D production uh, in terms of how did, how did your plane come about uh, if, they, if all J's were un, unpainted? So PBJs uh, are modifications. Um, starting with late D production and all the way through J production, paint was considered a modification. Now that's not to say there was a modification plant that was uh, at the airport and we very easily could have pulled it over there and did the modifications over there, which some of them did. But any plane that was designated to be a PBJ was shipped off and the necessary modifications, including paint, were done. So um, in terms of the Army, you'll see uh, the Army records say, we built this plane, we accepted this plane, we gave it to the Navy. Do with it as you will. Um, and then, of course, the Navy had their standards and, you know, everything. And there's a whole other set of rules that followed there. But those were essentially modifications that were done after the factory. And, and wasn't that here in the local area? 
One of them, it, it, some of that could have been, yes. Um, when it gets to modification, it gets really fuzzy because modification was done wherever they could. Um, and so they did it, whatever modification, modification center had, uh, if they needed a plane now, it went to whoever could get it done now. If there was a backlog somewhere, they didn't get it. Uh, but there were quite a few air aircraft that were modified here in Kansas City. Can I add something to it, Dan? Please. So the, um, the planes are assigned, and it's really interesting, the planes are also assigned a sequential U.S. Air Force serial number. So it Correct. So they have 43-27, blah, blah, blah. But as soon as it was delivered to the Navy, and on the aircraft data cards, the Air Force aircraft data cards basically said, on this date it was delivered, and on this date it was transferred to the Navy. And at that point, the Navy was assigned a bureau number, Correct. So I originally had an Air Force number, but mm -hmm. then at that point it became a Navy plane. And they went, most of them went to Cherry Point, North Carolina. And it's like Dan said, it's fuzzy. We haven't been able to ascertain where they painted there in Cherry Point or where they painted a mod center and sent to Cherry Point. But yeah. it was delivered as an Air Force plane, and the Navy took over and did what they needed to do with it. Yeah, all, all B-25s have an Air Force serial number. Um, there's a small group of them. All of the PBJs um, will have that kind of disappeared over time uh, and became a, a, a Buno. So, anything else? Now, now that we've restored this plane, have yeah. you done any extra research? On, oh, on, on PBJs? Now, on just because, on that one there? One. So, it, yours gets to be, <laughs> Yours gets to be a, a little bit of a conundrum, quite honestly, be, because of, of the, the record keeping and stuff like that. We're switching over from Army, Army to Navy and, and those kind of things. Um, I think, honestly, I think David probably knows more about your plane than I do um, right now. He's taught me a lot, and he's got a lot of really good research on, on the, the Navy planes and stuff like that. And, and I was kind of hoping that he was going to come along with you guys so I could learn more, and i just sit here and geek out for a few hours with him. But... Um, but yeah, we, we will eventually get to all of them. We've made a conscious decision that we're going to focus on the Army side first because that's where they were all born and then go back when, we're, when we get all of those completed and get all of our aircraft data records and everything sorted out and then we're going to hit the PBJs and, and get all those sorted out. And uh, not to discriminate or anything like that, but there's one PBJ that we care about. <laughs> well, I guess there's 11 of them underwater if you want to count those, but there's really just, you know, there's... So what, 12 surviving PBJ airframes, and yours is the only one that's really, yeah, if, well, anything other, any, that's realistically viewable except by photograph, because uh, the others are about 150 feet under seawater. So um, we've made the decision to kind of go where the other 9,888 of them are, uh, and, then, and then we'll get yours later. We, I, we fully, I've got four or five historians that I work with on a regular basis, including myself, uh, and Mike here, and um, even David, and um, I'm fully aware that this is, I've been doing it for 25 plus years, and I'll be doing it another 25 plus years, and I still won't know half of what I want to know. Anything else? Thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate the time, and I'm glad you guys sat there so interested. And Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks.